Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second installation in our webinar series on using the Tribal Forest Protection Act to advance tribal climate adaptation priorities. If you weren't here with us on Tuesday, uh, we had a great session on the background and nuts and bolts of the Tribal Forest Protection Act and also on indigenous perspectives of climate adaptation. That webinar uh, was recorded and shared. I'll post the link here in just a second so you're able to keep up with, with uh, both of these sessions. <clears throat> Today, we're going to have a, a panel of presenters that I'm really excited about. Just stepping back for a moment, just to, to give you all the, um, the overall purpose of this webinar series. Uh, I'm working with a range of collaborators um, from Indian Country and the Forest Service around this idea of using the Tribal Forest Protection Act to advance tribal climate adaptation priorities and also just to facilitate greater collaboration between tribal nations and associated national forests. This is a two-part webinar series, like we mentioned. Um, the idea here is just generally to raise awareness of TFPA uh, across the country, but particularly in the region where, where I work with my partners uh, in the Midwest and Northeast. So I'm excited to see many of you on the webinar um, from our, our part of the world. I'm really excited about the range of presenters we have today who are all going to be sharing their real world experiences going through uh, and uh, proposing, getting accepted and starting to implement projects through the Tribal Forest Protection Act. So we have Keith Carnes from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and Micah Raber from the Chippewa National Forest, Shirley Picosa from the Pueblo of Acoma and Sean Martin from the Cibola National Forest, Brandon Rogers from the Yakima Nation and Jean Schell from the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, and Dan Kippervaser from Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, talking about the project uh, that they have in collaboration with the Tulalip tribe. So uh, I'll let each of them introduce, each speaker will introduce themselves in a little more detail to, in a little more detail to give you their, their background. Um, we're going to have sort of a, a round robin of short prepared remarks to open this session off. So each group here will give you a, an overview of the kind of work that they have proposed through the TFPA, some of their lessons learned, any details about um, their experience with the process that they want to share right off of the top. So you'll just get some, some quick sketches of these four example projects. That'll take us through maybe the first 45 minutes or the first hour of this webinar. And then we're saving a lot of time, uh, the second half of the session, for back and forth Q&A. And we'll take this wherever you as participants want to go. So I hope um, you come with a lot of questions and enthusiasm today. Um, before we begin, I'd, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to all of our presenters for being willing to share your time and your expertise with us. And lastly, I guess I should introduce myself, um, just so you know who's, who's yapping at you here. My name is Stephen Hander. I work for the Forest Service Northern Research Station and the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. I'm based in Houghton, Michigan in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, my background is in climate adaptation. Specifically, that's been the, the entry point of my work with tribes and national forests all across this region. And that's how uh, I wandered into this TFPA topic. <clears throat> so I've been excited to get to know a little more from each of our panelists over the last couple of weeks. And without further ado, I'd like to start off with Keith and Micah. So I'll ask you both to um, come on camera and please tell us about your experience.
Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Mike Raber. I'm an ecosystem staff officer on the Chippewa National Forest. Been here for a little over two years now. So this is um, this is something that for me, you know, I didn't have uh, much background with TFPA before coming over here. And as you'll see on the, the first slide as we're presenting here, the overlap that that the Chippewa and the Leech Lake Reservation have, it's kind of uh, this is the degree of overlap is like, okay, this is really a place where we, we have to do this jump in with both feet. So, um, so yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting as we go through this and give everybody a taste of kind of what we have. And that's just a taste because we've got a bunch of these uh, stacked up and coming. And then Keith, if, uh, if you're on. I am on. Um, yeah, like Micah said, I mean, I'm, I guess, firstly, I mean, my name's Keith Carnes. I'm the forestry director for Leech Lake. Uh, we're gonna go over a little bit of one of our TFPA projects that we have five of them uh, kind of running a full gambit of fire restoration, uh, climate change work, uh, air, habit restoration. And I think, uh, Micah, you're just going to go through this quick little little PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll go through it. And what I'm going to do is uh, do a little introductory at the beginning, but then when we get into what the TFPA proposals are, if you want to just kind of run through that quick with folks, that'll be okay. That'd be, yeah. So is uh is the my screen shared, Stephen? I'm seeing the slides sorting. Okay. Okay, so as I just mentioned, this is um, this is the, the proclamation boundary of the Chippewa National Forest here. And then this is the outer boundary of the Leech Lake Reservation. So with the exception of this little fringe right over here on the edge, and this little piece right here south of the town of Deer River, it's, it's about, it's just under 50% of the forest is within the boundary of the Leech Lake Reservation. And so um, the whole question of adjacency is kind of, uh, it's academic for us. It's pretty much everywhere here is adjacent for pretty much any purpose, um, given the, the adjacency of effects, even in the areas just off of um, outside of the reservation, there's not not uh, big chunks that, that get very far away from where there would be effects. And so um, we've got uh, we've got a kind of an interesting project that has kind of two parts to it, two two parts that are pulling from different TFPA proposals. And so this first one, Keith, do you want to give a little bit of background on it? Yeah, the, the this project this was one of the larger TFPA projects that was um, and they. Uh, to be around forest looking at some stuff and I realized how thick and uh, over dense some of these pine plantations were so we got into one about and wanted to have these plantations thinned more aggressively in that earlier entry to try to retain the live crown on there so these trees would be vigorous and be able to be resistant against climate change uh, at least hypothetically um, so this is a map of all the areas that were included. All the red are red pine plantations that are between 20 and 40 years old on the Chippewa National Forest and all the white are white spruce plantations that are located across. Go ahead, Micah. Then this area now in the circle, this was a, it was, it was a tight pocket of these red pine stands. And that ended up becoming its own side project called the Sand Plains Pine Project. It's about 5,000 acres of pine plantation, about 50,000 acres of entirety project that we're doing some thinning, some pine thinning in, working with the chip on that. We're utilizing reserve treaty rights lands grants to do brushing to start prepping the area for fire restoration in there as well. And so here we've got a we've got a uh, a closer look at that that sand plain pine project area between 
uh, Lake Winnebago Gosh over here on the right and Cass Lake, the lake itself on the left. And um, this is an area that we know from um, uh, ecological cover type. This is a, this is a fire dependent ecosystem. This is uh, it's a sand plain. Um, so gives you an idea, kind of a vision of the density of the projects and the stand ages that are in here that, uh, that we're looking at where um, we've got this, this, uh, this range of younger stands where we can be more aggressive with thinning earlier and try to get some of the diversity planting underneath and get the long-term structure of the area trending more towards the ecological value outputs as opposed to the economic outputs. Then overall, um, you know, really what it comes down to is, is the proposal is to increase at heart, is to increase the, the complexity of the red pine and white spruce plantations, minimize the risk of severe wildfires, um, reduce hazardous fuels. Uh, there are a few other things about starting to recruit more coarse woody debris and snags in the landscape naturally, and then increase the amount of um, you see the picture of blueberries there, increase the amount of fruiting shrubs in the landscape. So blueberries, of course, but service berries or Saskatoons, um, choke cherries, nanny berries, uh, you, wild plum, you name it. And so then there's a second component of this project, which is a fire restoration TFPA that uh, Leech Lake Band proposed. Um, and this is a uh, highlighted in orange here are these, these identified fire dependent or um, previously fire prone ecosystems. And the area that we had just highlighted for sand plain pine project is right, right here in the middle uh, between Lake Winnebago, Shish and Cass Lake. Uh, some of these places haven't seen fire for a number of years. So um, the vegetation structure has changed substantially from what was there before. So there's, uh, there's an over, overlapping um, desire put fire back on the landscape as a management tool, in addition to increasing the diversity and getting some more thinning uh, of these, these red pine plantations and white spruce plantations to more of uh, an open woodland. And so um, we combined the two um, as a 638 project. We had some funding available to us from the regional office. And um, since we had the sand plain pine project done, um, we were mostly covered for NEPA. We still have to, uh, or still had to come up with a categorical exclusion to cover uh, fire activity that would happen after we go in and thin some of the stands that we're looking at here. And in particular, there, there, are, there are two stands we're looking at, the total 48 acres. And so um, we, we put together a 638 agreement and there's a component of the, like the thinning component that has a commercial timber part. We wrote that out of the agreement. Um, we, had, we had a way to administer that on the Forest Service side, so we didn't have to. I mean, we we did look for some creative ways to deal with that. And what we came down to is just splitting the work for the 638 to focus on some of the project planning ahead of time, um, coming up with the burn plan and implementing the burn post harvest or post thinning. And then there's a phase phase two, phase three, where there'll be some planting, out planting of uh, native shrubs, diversity plantings, and then going back in and doing some monitoring to see you know, what does what the success look like here um, and how, how can we grow bigger on the landscape if this is something that works or how can we adjust if it, if it doesn't work out the way that we're, we're planning. And so this, is, uh, this just gives you an idea that the 48 acres we're looking at, it's in this really dense red pine plantation. So there's a section of it right here. And then uh, further down the row, that same road, there's another section of it on the north side of the road and I believe the, um, the split here is that one of these we're actually going to be doing, or the Leech Lake Band will be doing the diversity plantings after uh, fire is run through. And on the other portion, there, we're going to see uh, what we get for natural recruitment over time. So I'll give you an idea of what these stands look like before any of the thinning uh, started happening. This is what we're looking at um, in the area where there's a very high basal area. The live crown is, is starting to die back and there's a heavy hazel component in the understory. So um, we do have some historic photos. I don't have them on this presentation, but uh, 
It's very different from the, the native vegetation cover that was here about 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago before um, the large pines were, were wholesale removed from the landscape. And then after the thinning, this gives you an idea of how much more open the area is. Um, a lot more sunlight hitting the ground, so there's a lot more room for uh, second story diversity, or second growth diversity to come up. Um, there, was a, there was a very aggressive thinning and brush removal schedule here. Um, and then, uh, you know, there were some other ways of looking at, you know, how we could fund some of that work. So RTRL was used to fund some of it uh, in the past. And so RTRL, for those of you who don't know, is Reserve Tree Rights Lands Grant. Um, so that's where, that's where that funding came from. It was is to enhance um, ecological resistance to wildland fire. So this is something that was applicable in this case for some of that earlier work. It's not where the funding came from for the 638. Um, but for the 638, you know, that was something that we didn't have readily available the funding on the forest unit. So when the regional office made some money, some funding available, uh, we jumped at that. Um, and then that doesn't prevent the opportunity to still look at using RTL for RTRL for other fire restoration work related to the fire TFPA. So that's something that in this case, it's kind of worked to get this project to the point where we can go to the phase two, phase three steps. Um, and it's something that the LOBO is looking at here for FY23 and FY24 to try to expand this to a, a larger acreage on the, on the landscape. I think we might so, have to wrap up, Mike. Yeah, so if you want to take out, I think this is the last slide, Keith, so if you want to take us out. Okay, um, yeah, so I mean, we're considering this TFPA project. Uh, we're looking at it as a total of three phases. Now the 638 portion of it is phase two. And phase three, we're going to be looking at it, a different kind of thinning. You know, it's going to be post-fire, and we're going to be looking at uh, the understory reinitiation phase. So we can get into all that during the discussion portion of it. Thanks a lot, Stephen. That's perfect. A really nice overview, Micah and Keith. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you um, now, Shirley and Sean, um, Shirley Picosa, Sean Martin, if you both would uh, turn on your cameras, please, and give us an overview of your work down in New Mexico. Okay, I'll be sharing my screen here in a moment. Let me please let me know when it comes up. Okay, I'm seeing the slide uh, sorting view right now. Okay. Uh-oh. Ah, there we go. <laughs> it scared me for a moment. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sean Martin. And Sean, I'm just so you know, I'm, I'm seeing your notes view. If that Pardon? Matters. I'm seeing the presenter notes. Okay. It looks normal? No, I'm, I'm seeing the... I'm seeing like your presenter notes view with the next si si slide on the side. Oh, well, shucks. That's not what I'm seeing. Not quite sure how to get rid of that, to be honest with you. I apologize, folks. I'd presenter view. Ah, that looks better, huh? There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sorry for that delay. Um, so once again, my name is Sean Martin. I'm the forest silviculturist for the Cibola National Forest in West Central New Mexico. Uh, here to talk about our Horace Mesa Wildlife Habitat and Stand Improvement Project. Um, this is a picture from the top of Horace Mesa looking off to the northwest. So you can see, uh, if you're familiar with the Southwest, it's a lot of pinyon juniper uh, forest types uh, with a little bit of ponderosa pine mixed in. So um, also I should identify my other presenters. We also have Shirley Picosa, who is tribal forester with the Pueblo of Acoma. She'll be uh, helping with the presentation. And also I think we, we may or may not have Yolinda Begay, who is the district ranger for the Mount Taylor Ranger District. Uh, which this project is on. So 
we started off as a RTRL, Reserve Treaty Right Land uh, Project from a grant that was awarded in uh, 2015 uh, to the Pueblo of Acoma. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, TFPA didn't really exist or at least the ability, um, but it was to become a Tribal Forest Protection Act project. So what we did, so it, actually Acoma was, a, was awarded the RTRL. Um, we didn't actually have a project in place under decision. So we hustled together and we put together uh, this project using the category six, the wildlife habitat and stand improvement CE category. Um, and this covered a little over 5,000 acres. Um, and then to start doing some work under that, whoops, um, we entered into a non-funded participating agreement and we did that in uh, 2017. And that had a purpose of trying to strengthen the relationship through cooperation and communication via on-site educational opportunities, consultation and assistance with planning for implementation in locations culturally significant to the Pueblo of Acoma. So that's, uh, that's the official thing, but you know, what we really wanted to do was uh, reduce fire hazard uh, provide some fuel wood to the communities and, uh, you know, create a, a job training and workforce development type project for the Pueblo of Acoma so that, that they would have the opportunity to stand up their own natural resource crew and start doing some work on us and then uh, uh, complement that with other work that they've done on their side of the fence. Okay, this is uh, Shirley. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Charlotte Pequesa. I'm the forester for the Pueblo of Acoma. And I had started um, with the Pueblo during that year of 2015 when we were um, able to be awarded the RTRL grant. So that was um, my first big project with the Pueblo. And we were fortunate enough to work with um, the Cibola Forest Service on that project. And since I was new to the program, um, I was still kind of getting used to uh, being someplace new and also starting up a new Sawyer crew, which was also new to the Pueblo as um, they didn't have a Sawyer crew. And uh, I'm not sure how long it was, maybe 10 years, but um, it allowed us to, uh, get our forestry program established again with the RTRL grant. And before we were able to start work on the forest service, we were actually awarded additional funding through a, another group called the Lava Soil and Water Conservation District. And that allowed us to do thinning on Acoma site that was um, right adjacent to the forest service project site. And our crew, um, as I said, was a new crew. They were able to do work on Acoma before we moved to Forest Service. Uh, get, it gave them a chance to get used to each other's and um, I guess the overall uh, scope of work of both projects. And the picture on the left, um, you can see the boundary fence line. Um, the right side is Acoma lands and to the left is the Forest Service. So you can see where both projects uh, came together um, when we were able to start in Forest Service. And what it was was a lop and scatter. Uh, we didn't use any uh, machines. It was all done by hand. And to date, um, a little over 200 acres of forest restoration thinning has been completed across both landscapes. Next. Uh, just sharing a couple setbacks we did have with the projects. Um, uh, first was the NEPA clearances that needed to be done by BIA uh, Forest Service. Did have their clearance done. Um, but uh, BIA had to come in and um, I guess do their, their own clearance uh, due to the funding being uh, awarded by them. So that took a little while for them to do. And another thing was the fire restrictions. 
um, the times for uh, cutting were very limited. Uh, so that kind of uh, delayed a lot of production going for our crew and plus the project site was far away from the Pueblo. So the travel time uh, kind of factored into that too. And uh, we also had uh, issues with staff. Um, we had lost some of our staff for a while and it took a while to get uh, restaffed again. But um, we tried to do what we could with our, our resources that we had. And I think what uh, crew we did have, they did a pretty good job up there for uh, starting out our program again. And we just uh, want to continue with this project using the TFPA agreement. Go ahead, Sean. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Um, yeah, the crew did a really nice job of, of thinning. They followed the prescription quite well, which is uh, you know, essentially designed to generate fuel wood and reduce fire hazard, mostly low thinning, removing a lot of uh, ladder fuels and uh, kind of intermediate type trees. So we got to the point where the RTR, RTRL funding was not extended. So we started, you know, this 5,000 acre project, we, we had about a thousand acres that had sur uh, heritage survey and clearance. So we started looking for, uh, you know, other other ways to fund this project and to get ahead on the heritage survey so that we could keep going. Um, so we were selected as a TFPA project in 2021. And with that came $250,000, which uh, uh, we put into a 638 agreement with the Pueblo of Acoma. And this covered tree thinning and heritage surveys, as well as uh, some of the clearance work. Um, also, this also leveraged money from uh, uh, New Mexico State Forestry. So this year they've provided uh, about $100,000 um, to do some wildlife habitat thinning, uh, also try and uh, provide fuel wood to the communities. Um, that treated a little over 100 acres, um, and a lot of that was kind of in Ponderos Pine wood, PJ Woodland transition. Came out very nice. This seems to be a partnership that the state um, wants to continue with us. So annually, we're hoping to treat you know one or 200 acres a year under a good neighbor agreement, which we have with the state now. Um, this year, we were awarded some Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act money, um, which was $270,000. And this was specifically earmarked to do those surveys, those heritage surveys. Um, and so we um, were able to and do another 638 agreement for that to lock up that money, but also as part of that, because uh, Pueblo of Acoma, their heritage folks, didn't have the capacity to take on a survey uh, of this size, they were enter, able to enter into a little sub-agreement with uh, the Hopi tribe. So that agreement is, is just about to be signed. Um, it's, it's with our contracting, our GNA folks right now. So um, ACMA is actually going to oversee the survey work based upon our protocol. And the Hopi tribe is going to have their heritage folks go through and perform that work. So it's a it's a really nice partnership. All right. So I wanted to go over the timeline and how we got there uh, for the TFPA. So the proposal was prepared back in the spring of last year. Um, it was approved and recommended by the Cibola National Forest in May of 2021 for a regional forester approval. Um, also about that time, a few months later in August, uh, Pueblo of Acoma adopted uh, the project, the TFPA proposal uh, through resolution. And then uh, in September, a month later, we were able to get the agreement executed uh, in September. Um, so it was actually pretty quick. It, it went fast. Uh, you know, we already had the NEPA in place and we already had a partnership going. So I think because of that, we were able to get through uh, and get this agreement executed much quicker. Oh, you know what? I wanted to back up. I forgot to talk about these slides here. So part of our prescription process and what we're doing in terms of the restoration work, you can see the top photo on the upper right. 
That is a photo from 1935. The, the photo on the bottom is more modern from 20, 2015. So you can see in the, in the 80 years with uh, fire exclusion, it's really filled in quite a bit. So a big part of what we're doing out there in order to reduce fire hazard is to restore these conditions. So this is kind of what we're shooting for, a, a real clumpy groupy arrangement to where if fire does come through, there's plenty of gaps and openings for it to drop on the ground and not just run through all the way up to the top of Mount Taylor, which is a tribal cultural property. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to mention that. I think that's a very important piece. So we've continued impl implementation with ACOMA with their natural resource crew on acres cleared uh, for uh, cleared for heritage uh, work. Um, and we had to use previous surveys and clearances. We had a, a huge backlog in, in our heritage shop. So thankfully we had some other uh, uh, projects that had cleared some areas in there and the work hadn't actually been completed. So that enabled us to get in there uh, almost immediately and start doing work. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got survey and clearance remaining on 4,000 plus acres. Um, that is funded. And as I mentioned, uh, Hopi Tribe is going to work with ACOMA and us to get that done uh, starting in FY23. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, also, we are looking to uh, maybe develop a Wood for Life agreement. We've, uh, we've worked with, uh, we started to work with the National Forest Foundation. Um, that fell through. We were trying to partner with the Santa Fe National Forest, but we'd still like to do that. Uh, probably with the Pueblo of Acoma directly. So that's kind of what we're shooting for at this point. But that would provide um, wood to communities in need, you know, and it would also provide transportation of it down to those communities so they wouldn't have to come up and uh, collect it themselves. Fantastic, thanks, Sean. And I guess that's it, that's it. Um, if, if Yolinda's on and she wants to share a few words, I'm not quite sure if she's on. And if not, I think we're done. So appreciate your time. That's a great overview. And I'm sure we'll come back to you both with several questions. Shirley has already uh, fielded a couple in the chat. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, next I'll ask Brandon and Jean to come on down and uh, please Turn on your cameras and give us a, a recap of your TFPA experiences. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, let me uh, let me get this shared. Okay, what do you get? Uh, so what are you guys seeing? Are you seeing a uh, upper nascent restoration concept design? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Gene, you want to lead off with introductions? Okay. Um, yeah. So my name is Gene Shaw, and I'm the uh, Forest Fisheries Program Manager on the Okanagan and Wenatchee National Forest. Um, um, this map doesn't know where our forest is, but essentially we're on the eastern slopes of the Cascade Range in central Washington. Uh, we extend from the Canadian border about three quarters of the way down to to uh, the Oregon Washington border. And um, we're uh, a lot of us about, I think we're around a million acres. Um, we, have, uh, we, we have six ranger districts on our forest. And um, we, um, Yakima Nation is one of our most important uh, partners for uh, restoration and um, you know, joint conservation of land out here. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm Brandon Rogers, I work for Yakima Nation Fisheries, and I'm the Northern Treaty Territories Habitat Manager. And in that capacity, I oversee our restoration work in the Upper Columbia, including this project. So today, we're going to talk about this Upper Nason Creek restoration project, which we are doing under 638. Um, <clears throat> as Gene says, you know, it's in the north central part of, of Washington State. Um, the project is on. Mason Creek, and uh, so it's an aquatic project. It's not a terrestrial project. It's in-stream restoration work. Um, Mason Creek is deficient in a couple of different aquatic habitat indicators, large weed debris, pools, uh, side channels. 
Um, so this is just a, you know, a basic map showing Nason Creek. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but Nason Creek. Here's Nason as a, a tributary to the Wenatchee River. The Wenatchee River flows into the Columbia. So that's kind of that's kind of how all that works. Um, I'll just quickly go through a couple of slides here um, to show the kind of work that this project will do. So um, this is Nason Creek, the main stem of Nason Creek. Um, this is a proposed side channel that will be created by this project, big, large, uh, full, full uh, perennial side channel. Um, this, the project itself is two miles long. So it's, it's a big project uh, by our, our standards. Um, so what we're doing side channel and then also a lot of um, installation of large wood debris. And you can, you can see here on uh, page 10, these are all wood structures we'll be building. Uh, these will be engaged with the, with the channel. Um, at all, you know, all times of the year uh, for, for salmon and steelhead habitat. And this, this, most of the streams in our area have these, these issues where they're disconnected from their floodplain and don't have enough wood in them uh, for various reasons. So, so that's, kind of, that's kind of a little background on the project itself. And um, then I think we'll, we'll get into some of the other stuff we want to talk about. Um, so th the first is, you know, why, why is the Yakima Nation interested in this, in this project? Why are we here? Well, Nason Creek is... Um, within the, the the treaty territory of um of the yakima of the yakima nation and and so the treaty territory the ceded area however you want to call it um and and, and that's that's you know the tribe is interested in restoring uh, you know not only aquatic habitat but terrestrial habitat throughout its ceded area and so that's one of the you know that's the tribe's main interest in this overall is just it's it's a, a place they care about um, it's also, Nason Creek is also a high priority area from a science point of view uh, for salmon and sealite habitat restoration. And so the, the tribe takes science seriously. And so that's another reason why the tribe is interested in that. Um, and the last is, is really, from our point of view, that this is a project, um, it's big, it's two miles of, of work, but it's the kind of work that we're pretty good at. We've done a lot of this kind of stuff. And this is one of the, you know, first 638 projects in the Pacific Northwest. So we we wanted to make sure we picked a project that uh, was going to go well, and we'd have a, a really good high benefit project when we were when we were done with it. Um, so a little bit about the 638 process itself. Um, you know what, what we did. You know, as the instructions on the back of the cereal box <laughs> said, was you know send a send a letter to the regional forester and and you know request that this project be um, approved for. Uh, 638 and and it was and so once that we got that approval um we had a kickoff meeting we had a, a pretty large kickoff meeting with management and staff from uh the forest service yakima nation and also bpa and i'll tell you about bpa in a minute um uh, but we um we had that and that was because it, you know 638 tfpa is not totally new but 638 is pretty new and so we just want to make sure that everybody as we move forward was on the same page and having management there and really making sure that everybody was seeing that everyone was nodding their heads and saying yes this is what we want to do um was was a a good move and i encourage folks to do that um but then you know one of the one of the things that we're getting out of, out of the 638 process it does allow for some flexibility as, as others have already talked about um, but we're, we're able to transfer a lot of the heavy lift part of the planning responsibility over to Bonneville Power Administration they have they have more capacity than the forest does in this instance and so we're able to take NEPA and um, section 7 and parts of 106 and let BPA do the heavy lifting. The Forest Service is still completely involved and will be signing off on all the documents. Uh, but, but you know, taking some of the load off their capacity and, and bring it to BPA. So we had BPA in that meeting and they are completely part of this 638 process and the 638 um, project in, in general. And, and Gene, I think you've got a few things to talk about under this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I, was I on mute when I introduced myself? Or no. did you guys hear me? No, you're good. Okay, I was good. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest is, uh, is receiving um, large amounts of money from the bipartisan infrastructure law um, funding source and some other sources. And um, so, we're really ramping up our um, you know, terrestrial and aquatic restoration uh, programs. And, and so, we um, 
So with all that money, though, comes, you know, a huge workload and our forest doesn't have the capacity to, um, to plan, design, and implement all this uh, priority work. And so um, this, this TFPA process and then specifically what we've been working on, the 638 agreement, really boosts our, our capacity to uh, work towards our landscape for uh, threatened and endangered salmon and trout species up here. And uh, um, it's it's been um, you, you had a, a really you know pretty long uh, big positive relationship with the Nation Fisheries, and um, this is just a new tool that we've been able to use, use them, and and um, that has um, you know allowed us to sit closely with them um, in, you know, as far as project selection, um, you know, project design, and and everything. But but like Brennan said, it, it takes. Uh, Basically, most of the heavy lifting um, off our, our play. We kind of focus on other projects on our forest as well. So a lot, um, you know, you know, from you know, water stop down to the you know, sea level, you know, uh, project, respiratory projects. Um, and so it's um, so you know, and and it, it's just, um, you know, we've been working with our folks um to uh, um. We got through with the the Navy project, and now we're, we're looking at uh, um, this fall um, start initiating a few new ones. Um, we're still kind of trying to figure out uh, the best way, you know, how how to be most efficient with them. Um, whether that, um, like there, there's the ability to do um, like a master agreement under the 638 process, um, you can do like supplemental 638 agreement. So we're still trying to kind of figure out how to, how to fit in and with all that process. But, um, um, but we're, we're really excited about the success of the project. Um, we should be done with construction on this project at the end of next year. And um, we're initiating um, new projects that are very similar to this. Um, um, you know, this fall, we would be, you know, planning for this winter, next summer, and implementation for 25. Um, then our, our first hey, is team. also um, team team. Yeah. I'm sorry, your your audio quality is deteriorating rapidly. I'm gonna ask you to pause and maybe Brandon can chip in. I think I I think we caught most of what you were saying that you know you all are ramping up your aquatic restoration work on the national forest with increased funding sources, but that comes with a huge workload that you don't have capacity to keep up with. And so doing mm -hmm. these TFPA and 638 projects is an innovative way to boost the forest services capacity, which I think is a really proactive way to view this. And also you're considering a master uh, participating agreement to kind of be an umbrella for future work. I I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to pause and maybe Brandon can can pick up from now on. Sure, I, I can do that. Um, I, I caught most of what Gina was saying. I, I think most folks did, but you know, it, it's true. Um, we're, you know, we're working on more 638 agreements. We're working on, like I said, the, the idea of maybe a master 638 agreement that allows us to do multiple projects. And, and you know, it's, it's just a really important tool, uh, 638, TFPA 638, um, you know, to, to do more projects more quickly and with greater flexibility. And I think that's, that's you know, that's the utility of it. And that's why we're talking about it. And, um, it's it's really changing. It's, I think it's really changing the way that we're working with the Forest Service and they're working with us. So it's it's great. It's been it's been great so far, and we're looking forward to really putting it to even more use in the very near future. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we are um, we do have an agreement on this project until March thirty first of twenty twenty six, and and currently the uh, the project is slated for construction. Uh, next next summer, we we feel good about that timeline. We've got materials staged already, and um, we're we're gonna get that thing done next summer. And that'll be that'll be a, a you know kind of the first little win there, and, and we'll move on for there. Um, I wanted to talk at the end of this, uh, you know, the, the future use of of six thirty eight. We already talked a little bit about that, but you know, it is an important tool, and 
and, and Gina was talking about the, the partnership and relationship of the Forest Service and the Yakima Nation. We do have a very long standing relationship with the Forest Service. We have an MOU that goes back to the early 90s, and we have handshake agreements and other things that go back to the 1930s for huckleberry picking and things. So we've worked with the Forest Service for a, a very long time, and um, we, we, we work well together. And six or eight is just another tool to, to make that um, that work easier and and allows both to be a little bit more creative. Um, and I just I'm just going through. Let's see. Um, you've already talked about that. And uh, yeah, well, and the final thought is yeah, the 638 is is still like I said, kind of new, um, and we're still trying to figure out you know the, the best ways to use it, the most creative ways to use it. But we're we're doing a good job of that, and, and we'll just we're going to continue to to work on that. So. Uh, I think that's I think that's our presentation. Thanks, Brandon. I really appreciate that. Thanks for the overview. Okay, and last but certainly not least, Dan, uh, if you're up there, Dan uh, Kipperbosser. Hey, sure. hey, everybody. Um, let me pull up my my page here, and we'll get rolling. Um, Let's see. So I think I can keep this pretty brief. Uh, so much good content has already come out. Uh, can you see my page? Yes, looks perfect. Great. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Dan Kipperbosser. I am the Shared Stewardship and Strategic Operations Coordinator for the Mount Baker Snoqualmie. Um, unfortunately, my co-managers from the Tulalip Tribes couldn't make it here, so I will do my best to represent them. Um, this is a project that we uh, put together uh, a couple of years ago. This uh, project, uh, so the, the, the quick context on it, it's, it's the beaver project. Um, in our landscape, uh, beavers were uh, historically really abundant. They were all over the place, but over time, because of different kinds of uses and trapping, they were basically uh, extirpated largely from our landscape. So, um, so they're they're really largely missing, and um, and there were some strange legislation kinds of things in place that um, where there were beavers in places that they were not wanted because they were causing uh, challenges for other landowners and other uses. Uh, the only option that there was was for uh, putting them down rather than uh, what the tribe preferred, which was to relocate them into beneficial places. Um, we know, and certainly the tribes have known for even longer, that uh, beavers play a really key role in our ecosystems. Their dams uh, are just essential for proper natural functioning. So they are uh, they are a key species in our landscape and maintaining riparian health. The dam work that beavers do uh, in, in terms of uh, climate change play a pivotal role in terms of managing and moderating water flows. So when we have really high flows from flooding, they can slow down our water. And then when we have those dry periods where water levels go down, the slow release of water from our dams um, maintains moisture and water in our streams uh, for longer. So um, having beavers on our landscape, doing the things that they naturally do really uh, plays a key role in um, maintaining overall riparian and aquatic health. And so uh, that was really the context for um, the Tulalip tribes bringing this forward as something that they want to do uh, in their uh, usual and accustomed areas uh, that uh, intersect with the national forest. So from in terms of the history that brought us to here, We've had a memorandum of agreement with the Tulalip tribes since 2007. Uh, there was a lot of good work that was being done between the tribes, the University of Washington and forest staff on developing a model to identify really, really great places to put beavers that would be optimal for their success and where they could do their good natural work. Um, there was a test relocation in the South Fork of the Skycomish River in 2014. It was very successful. And then after a uh, TFPA workshop that, uh, that happened in 2017, when the forest and the tribes uh, uh, went together to learn about this, uh, got us going on the idea of uh, putting together a TFPA proposal. And so they, we did, we put it together, we developed it together, and then it was formally submitted in 2019. Um, the proposal that they put in uh, and submitted to the regional forester 
was based on adjacency and the need for restoration activities. And I'm going through this quickly because I want to get really to the question and answer section. Um, this is the Beaver. This is the outcome of the Beaver intrinsic potential model that the tribes developed, fielded, and uh, and then executed. So you can see a bunch of little dots scattered across the South Fork Stillaguamish watershed. Those are the places where their data indicated that um, there is a high potential for success in relocation and uh, high potential for quality in terms of the habitat. And so, uh, in their proposal, they requested. Uh, money for two seasonal employees and all the supplies that they would need for three years to do this work. Uh, and we're going to be looking at up to 30 relocations over those three seasons. Um, the Tulalip tribes, uh, in terms of the portion of this that they would take care of, which really, I'll be honest, is just about everything. Uh, they're going to go out and review the site quality, prepare the locations with, um, you know, sort of the, the the initial work that needs to be done to, to improve the chances of success. They would trap the nuisance beavers from other locations, uh, check their health, relocate them into the optimal locations, and then in the process, uh, continue to coordinate with the forest to just make sure that we don't create any uh, different kinds of use conflicts where, you know, like we install a brand new culvert and then they uh, relocate a beaver right into the middle of it, and then suddenly our culvert stops working. So it just the logistics of managing um, our lands together at the same time. Uh, and then they'll continue to monitor the success of the uh, beavers. So I thought I was going to be the cool kid talking about 638, um, but apparently everybody's doing it. So good on everyone for working with 638. We were the first project uh, for the Forest Service um, that was uh, done under 638. So we had the extra lift of developing how the Forest Service is going to do 638. So the, the, the paperwork, the forms, how they're going to be structured, the provisions, all that kind of stuff uh, was stuff that we had to work out in advance because it wasn't in place at the time. Um, the real focus there, and this was done collaboratively, is a round table with multiple tribes uh, and organizations um, the, the focus was to keep this as simple as possible, as flexible as possible, so that uh, it can be easily adopted with minimum burden and maximum flexibility. And I think we got there, um, but that took a little bit of extra time for us uh, and, and then OGC review and all that other kind of stuff because, you know, it's government and that's how it goes. Uh, but in the end, we got there. Um, the proposal was approved by the regional forester. Uh, then we signed the agreement in a signing ceremony. We had um, uh, Councilwoman Terry Gobin uh, from the Tulalip Tribes. We had uh, Jody Wheel, our uh, forest supervisor. And because it was the first one for the agency, Under Secretary Hubbard came along too to sign. And so we had a three way signing uh, of the agreement, and the project is underway. Um, our first year, we had a COVID delay um, that was a little bit challenging, so we didn't get out into the field or the tribes didn't get out into the field. Um, but uh, we eventually did, the work started. Um, we did an upfront lump sum payment of, uh, of the cash to enable the work to get done. That's one of the wonderful flexibilities that comes out of 638. Um, uh, Molly Alves, who is the uh, field manager for Tulalip Tribes, was out there with her crew that um, was hired using these funds, and they were conducting surveys. And I guess to their credit um, and the credit of their model, they found that just about every location that they identified with their model was in fact occupied by beavers. So spot on on the modeling. Um, but what that did mean is that um, they weren't going to be relocating beavers into places where beavers were already established. So we worked together uh, to identify alternate sites in a different watershed that would still have the same kinds of benefits and would still allow the work to move forward. Um, and they are working right now to establish those sites and relocate beavers um, as we speak. So, so overall, really successful. Um, the Tulalip tribes have been fantastic throughout this thing, very patient with us as we've navigated our own bureaucracy. 
Um, and we got to a point where we have uh, a great template for 638 that's being used everywhere. And, uh, and the project is exactly what we wanted it to be, which was that the tribes would completely take the reins on, um, on managing and improving habitat in areas that are important to them and important to us. And, uh, and so we're now off into the implementation phase and then soon into the monitoring phase to see how, um, how those beaver populations are establishing and uh, and growing. And so with that, I will finish and say thanks and then move on to the next phase. Thanks, Dan. All right, what a tour. And I, I don't think I actually realized this um, as I was talking with all of our speakers, but you all also provided us a nice window into um, 638 authority, which Tori Haka covered in, in more detail on our Tuesday webinar. Um, Dan, I guess I should have had you go first as the original cool kid uh, going through TFPA, but that's a nice connection between all of these TFPA projects as well. So I'm sure some of you picked up on that. So we have um, a couple of questions coming in already on the chat. I would encourage you all to please fire away with your questions. I'm sure if, if you are holding on to a question, chances are someone else in the audience is also wondering that same thing. I have some initial prompting questions to get things kicked off uh, with our panelists, um, but I don't want to be the only one uh, getting my questions received here. So uh, please put your questions in the chat and then all of our panelists, please come back. Um, Put yourselves on camera here to invite um, invite our participants and fire away. <clears throat> okay, I'll start off with one general question for everyone to please comment on, and that'll give us time for some audience questions to come in. Okay, so you, many of you, kind of mentioned some uh, I don't know pitfalls, forks in the road delays, obviously, you know, COVID delays. Um, so let's, let's flip that around. Um, so what advice would you give to tribal leadership and staff as they consider entering a TFPA project? We'll go back to Frontier. I'll start with you, Dan. You know, the, probably the the first and biggest one, which is, mo is I'm sure obvious to everyone, but um, but I've seen I've seen it happen inadvertently, is um, it is very challenging when a when a TFPA uh, proposal shows up uh, somewhat unannounced. Um, it, there is a timeline associated with uh, responding to that, and uh, and just sort of whips everything into a crisis. So really, I would say. To be successful, um, just be prepared to have a lot of those great early conversations. If you have those established relationships, you know that's where it would happen. Um, and then developing those um, uh, those proposals with a very specific eye towards meeting the criteria that are in the legislation. Um, just like being crystal clear about how you're responding to those questions of adjacency and how you're defining adjacency. And uh, it just, you know, it's the box checking, but doing that work, uh, collaborating long in advance and then putting it in together, developing it together, I think really just makes the process super smooth uh, to get through the approval process with minimum delay or go backs for revisions or anything like that. So start early, work together, uh, and then make sure you are crafting it um, to check the boxes is I guess my my first recommendation for going through quickly. Brandon, is there anything you'd add to that? Well, that was that was very good. And I want to thank Dan for for being the guinea pig for this whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, I would I would say that um, in addition to to what was just said, if you end up going down the 638 path um, to tribal folks should remember that there that does allow you some flexibility. And so like like for ours, um, the the 638 agreement that was was set up um, 
didn't really have provision for the tribe to bring the funding, which is what we were doing in that case. We we weren't actually asking for funding from the Forest Service. We were just asking for the authority. Um, so we had to change that. We had to we had to re revise that whole 638 agreement. And um, it, you know, and that's fine. We it took some time. We did it. Um, but I I think so. That would be my my thought is remember there's some flexibility there. Ask for the flexibility you need. Work with. Um, your partners at the Forest Service on that, and you know it, it may take a little time, but it's it's you know it's worth it if you if you really need um, you know flexibility somewhere one one place or another. I like that too, uh, Shirley, or or Sean. Is there anything you would add? You know, new tribal staff or leadership who are new to this whole thing. What what advice would you give them? I would say um, it really helps to have. Um, leadership on board and, and pushing for it. Um, we were lucky enough to have uh, the district ranger, Yolinda Begay, was really the biggest cheerleader um, and worked very closely with the tribe and with Shirley to, uh, you know, get to the point we're at today. You know, I think without without her, we, we probably wouldn't be at the point we are now. So I would say that. Um, there's a question about heritage surveys in there and how it informed the Acoma project. Um, so basically out here, before we do, you know, any kind of groundbreaking activities, we have to do some sort of a archaeological or heritage survey. Um, we just kind of lump archaeology and everything, all those surveys entail just under heritage. So, uh, you know, the survey gets done, um, sites are identified, we work with the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, and to determine what needs to be protected or not. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And then uh, we'll write a clearance, which says what we can and cannot do in terms of uh, implementation, uh, whether we protect or whether we do something different to mitigate sites. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And then I'll turn it over to Shirley if she has any more to, anything more to add. I just wanna... Um... I guess say the same thing as Sean. I really do appreciate the guys at the Forest Service. Um, Sean as well. Sean and Yolinda were a big part in getting this TFPA uh, project going again. Um, when we got the RTRL, it was very new to all tribes and um, very new to me. So to have it revived again through this project is real uh, encouraging. And we just look forward to working with them again, continue our thinning on um, Horace Mesa. Hey, and Keith and, and Micah, what advice would what you, advice give, to you give to tribes that are tribes just that entering are this process? I'm gonna go back and echo what Dan said uh, to start this is early coordination is important. So, if, if you're looking at, at using TFPA for the authority to enter onto and do, do work, that's something that's already NEPA cleared, that's great. But if, that, if you have an idea that, that we don't have NEPA clearance for yet, uh, it really helps to have those discussions as you're developing the TFPA proposal so that if we have a NEPA project or a review that's going on, um, we can tailor that or we can incorporate that into the NEPA so that it has NEPA clearance when it's ready to be implemented um, so that we're not waiting then, you know, trying to find a way to, to, to put something back onto the NEPA schedule to come back and, and hit projects that might be scalable up to several thousand acres and especially becomes a big deal when it's larger projects like that because we still need to do the NEPA, come up with a decision and then disclose what we're gonna do. So there needs to be some degree of specificity in there for that public disclosure that you know, making sure that that goes into the TFPA proposal for something that maybe isn't isn't geared towards doing work that's already been NEPA cleared. That's uh, that's really big, um, just to avoid delays in getting around to the point where we can say, oh yeah, we've got a shovel ready project or projects, or or a large scale thing that we'd like to pursue, um, because it, it's really easy. You know, if you're if we're tight in a NEPA schedule or or we're down some staff for things to slip a year or two, and we really don't want to be in that situation when there's something timely. That sounds like 
Nipa Ninja sort of experience. I like that practical thinking. Keith, how about you? Yeah, I mean, everybody is saying, you know, you got to kind of work with your partners. Uh, you know, I look at some of these TFPAs that we're doing, it's, if anything, it's a little bit of a tweak from business as usual, you know, which is why the TFPA often seems to be brought into, into the fold. Um, so some people, I mean, they don't necessarily embrace it right away. You know, it's, it's something that's different, maybe a little scary and all this here. So, I mean, you got to kind of keep your foot on the gas pedal and, and just keep, you know, talking to people about it, you know, alleviating some of these concerns. Um, I, I, I do it almost on a daily, daily basis. You know, we talked about risk versus reward because some of these things, that, you know, like the fire restoration, it's riskier. It ain't a lie. That's a fact. But in the reward, if, if you can get people to step over kind of that idea and start embracing some of this as an as a ecological restoration idea, you know, the hope is that it'll, it'll kind of calm down. Uh, we're kind of in that pattern right now, so we'll see. Okay, we've had a, a couple of questions come in on the chat. I'm going to circle back around to an earlier one that um, Tia asked, and that is, for any of these examples, did any tribes get funds from USDA Tribal Conservation District grants? Is that something that contributed to any of these projects? I'm seeing Shirley shake her head no. Brandon shaking his head no. Keith shaking his head no. Tia, if you have a link or something to share about Tribal Conservation District grants, I can package that up with the notes. Um, that I'm sharing. Always interested to hear about other funding sources. And that was another common thread that I picked up from a couple of your projects is that a lot of you were grabbing funding from other places, whether it was that RTRL or Brandon, you mentioned, you know, BPA. Um, so yeah, always happy to hear about other, other options. Uh, let's see, Amelia asked a question. <laughs> Did any of the projects conduct an inventory of understory, traditional, or cultural foods and medicines? And if so, are they protected or monitored for response to project implementation? I'm thinking Keith and Shirley for sure, since yours were kind of upland projects, I'd be interested to hear if that was part of the survey work beforehand? Of course, there's their NEPA. And when they're looking at that, they're looking at, uh, we have all, our tribal historic preservation officer and they work, they work hand in hand with the Chippewa archeology span. Uh, when it comes up, I don't hear about it. There is nothing. So then it's just green light go forward. Um, that's all. That's all I would know on it. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't meddle into medicinal plants very much. You know, I leave it to uh, tip open. Shirley or Sean, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I responded a little bit in the chat. Um, you know, it's not something I agree with what Dan Kipperwasser uh, added. It's not something that typically falls under the heritage program. Um, however, if, uh, you know, partners like uh, Pueblos or tribes um, have that specific request or interest, I think it's something we can incorporate. And I know we have incorporated that into another project in the Sandia Mountains. And I think, you know, because of our, our partnership, um, with uh, Akama and Hopi doing a lot of the, the survey work, I think this project would be ideal. And, uh, you know, I would look forward to including that in as part of our survey. Yeah, I, I, I'd say that um, TFPA projects specifically are probably better positioned to identify those kinds of resources than our 
vanilla projects that we've got out there because of the you know tight integration between the forest service and a tribal co-manager from day one uh, the odds of you know us selecting areas specifically because it'll either enhance uh the locations of medicinal plants and other uh, uh first foods or uh because we'll have direct and tight connection with um with tribal members who can tell us to watch out there's there's important stuff there that we need to protect i think the, this is probably the best case scenario for identifying that otherwise it typically comes when we do our consultation process great thanks everyone um okay james had a good question in the chat here what level of specificity is needed in a tfpa proposal in terms of specific actions in a specific watershed or can a proposal be a tribe's you know more general climate adaptation plan where there are numerous activities identified for cultural foods but maybe not specifics on where what's your what's your um reaction to like the specificity that's required in tfpa micah i see you're getting in there with the chat would any of you like to respond as well to James James's question? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Mike on that. I think um, I think like the initial proposal, you can be really, really high level on it. But you know, when you get down to where you're going to want to do something, that your your specificity is going to have to be uh, honed to a little bit more, you know, just because of me. But, uh, yeah, I would agree. You know, we definitely in our TFPA proposal to the regional forester had a lot of specificity. Um, you know, just I, I don't know how you could do it at, at a climate like a climate change action plan level because the forest service has to understand what they're what they're agreeing to up front. I think so. Got to have some specificity. I'll. I'll add a, a counterpoint to that because because I, I love flexibility. Um, so I have an example with a different tribe, uh, the Muckleshoot tribe uh, in our area that we we uh, sign a TFPA agreement with them. So the forest separately did a landscape scale uh, NEPA analysis and and that's done. And so we identified the kinds of works that we would do. Um, after that, however, we developed a TFPA proposal with the Muckleshoot, uh, where in that proposal, we identified a series of types of projects that we would be doing with the Muckleshoot tribe based off the NEPA. So from, from terms of identifying the kinds of work that we would do, we identified that under the NEPA. And so we're kind of clear on that side, but with the TFPA, uh, our proposal really only laid out the first of what we anticipate to be many projects that we'll do together with them. And so we left actually a good bit of flexibility for ourselves to later on figure out which of the authorized activities we would do with the tribe. So we're clear, specificity authorized the kinds of activities, but which ones we would ultimately do with the tribe, we left a bit open for us to discuss to see what's going to meet their needs, their timing, their resources, their availability down into the future. Um, and and at least I think because all of those things still served the intention of TFPA in terms of protecting the adjacent tribal lands, um, it was good enough to get through uh, the review process, but still left us the flexibility to decide later with the tribe what what's going to work best for them. So a little bit, definitely we still had some specificity there, but for the proposal itself, we left ourselves some flexibility with the tribe. Dan, I'm glad you bring that up and I know you know national forests around the country are experimenting with different ways of of kind of throwing a big tarp over a NEPA project and how how specific are you across the landscape or in a particular place um, and so as as those more innovative NEPA projects get through then yeah maybe as TFPA projects can nest within those that that opens things up um, so thank you for sharing that too I know some some national forests in our region are are doing those kind of forest wide or landscape wide uh, NEPA ideas as well. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to 
to go back to something that maybe was um, counterintuitive for me when I started learning about TFPA. Um, so I'm going back to my list of prompting questions. This is another moment for you all in the audience to please uh, fire away with your questions. Um, when I when I start started learning about TFPA, obviously the, the first thing you hear about is, you know, fire and fuels and kind of thinning projects to reduce fire hazard. That was the, the origin story of TFPA. But then there's this breadth that sometimes is easy to, um, easy to ignore. And so I'm wondering, you know, how did, um, the, the reason I'm excited about you all is that you have really shown the, the full diversity of projects that could go through a TFPA. You know, it's not just forest thinning, but it can also be that. Um, so how did you how did you learn in the first place that TFPA was an option to look at, for example, like fish habitat, beaver relocation, you know, all of that stuff might have been uh, counterintuitive for some people from the start. Uh, Brandon, I'll start with you. Oh boy, um, yeah. I, you know, our um, director of natural resources, Phil Riggin, was involved in kind of reshaping TFPA a little bit. I, I don't remember exactly how, but he he was very plugged into that. He was also very plugged into uh, getting six thirty eight put into the farm bill, and so with that, he made. I mean, he, not him personally, but, you know, he understood that it would not, that, that stuff would not apply only to the terrestrial treatments, but also the aquatic treatments. So he came back and told us, you know, start, start looking at this, start using this. So that, that's kind of how we became aware of it. Would anyone else like to share kind of your uh, your entry point into TFPA? Yeah, I, I will. Um, you know, when we first entered into it, I actually had had forest staff say that it's only for because you know that's what it was wrapped around. You know, in California and the wildfires that happened there in two thousand three. But if you read the act, you know, I mean, the act, if you read through it, it's about all this fuel loading, you know, adjacency and fire and everything. But there's a caveat in there that, or if it's an area in need of restoration, that's what we've gone on to. I mean, because, you know, what is it? Is it upland? Is it lowlands? Is it, all these areas can use restoration and restoration can wear a lot. Of so that, that's what we, and I mean, it's right in the act. So. Shirley, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that as well? Yeah, for me, the um, TFPA was introduced to me by the district ranger, Yolinda. Um, she had told me about it when the pandemic started. So since things were kind of um, quiet here at the Pueblo, we were actually shut down for most of the time when it first started. So that gave me a chance to kind of um, focus on my time on working with Yolinda to come up with a proposal for the TFPA. So we worked on that together during 2020 and it was the following year where we submitted it. And um, since we were kind of uh, down about not getting refunded through the RTRL grant, um, it kind of gave me hope again that that project that we started could continue with this. And I was uh, kind of, um, I guess, expecting some sort of funding to be there. And where I had um, prepared like a budget to go with the project, but uh, Yolinda informed me that there is no funding that goes with the TFP, but um, it would be kind of a 
a first step to trying to get more money to continue with the thinning project. So as the um, proposal was approved and we did enter into a stewardship agreement, um, the Forest Service and the state of New Mexico um, went and granted funding for this project. So in the end, we were awarded uh, some money to continue and um, Sean was able to uh, get a crew to begin work again out there on the ground. And then bringing the Hopi tribe into this uh, was good for us since um, I think the pandemic is still having a, an effect on us here at Acoma and we weren't able to use our own cultural survey crew to go out there and do these heritage, heritage surveys. So um, we brought in the Hopi tribe. Since I know that uh, they're capable of doing this type of work and our tribes are pretty much similar and in what we find um, culturally significant. So I thought it was a good thing to invite them in and adds to our collaboration for this whole thing. So that's how um, this whole TFPA kind of worked out for us here at Akuma. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, okay, let's do it. Let's do a question that's a little more um, nitty gritty with TFPA, something we talked a lot about on Tuesday. In our, in our TFPA nuts and bolts session was this idea of adjacency and that adjacency doesn't have to mean, you know, direct physical adjacency, but adjacency can be relative to the risk that you've identified. And so I, I would like to hear it from you all in your own words, like how did you articulate the risk in this project and how did that affect your concept of adjacency? Um, and how'd you, how'd you meet that checkbox as Dan put it? Um, let's see, uh, Keith, you're already off of mute. Keith and Micah, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, again, early, early on, I mean, the idea of adjacency came up. I mean, I, I had people that were looking at it, is it right on the fence line? you know that that's what adjacency is and 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 we argued it i worked with um the name's gonna escape me sandra sonia sonia from california she was a she was a pioneer with tfpa at the time and argued that the idea of adjacency is a gray area uh, up here we're basically at the headwaters of the Mississippi. I can remember doing, you know, that we do up here. You know, if we were to put a bunch of, if there was an industry that put a bunch of mercury into the Mississippi River here, all the way down in Minneapolis, St. Paul at the state capitol, it would cause an issue. So we could argue that there's adjacency there, you know, because the risk being realized, it's anywhere where the risk can be realized. And that, like out in the Northwest, that can be huge, absolutely huge areas. You know, I mean, some of these fires that I'm too scared to go to, but we got fire guys that go to them. And I mean, they're just, they're monsters. So, I mean, what is adjacency? It could be a state over or more. So, but it's gotten to be relatively um, embraced that that's the idea now, you know, is the risk. Micah, would you like to add anything to that from the Forest Service side of the discussion? Yeah, the way that that uh, we approached, like coming in, we didn't have a good feel for okay, what's the agency operating procedure for this? What's the what's the what's kind of the implementation guide? But um, looking at it in terms of you know not the border per se, but what is what is the adjacency of the effect, or what is the potential for an effect for for something happening here to to have some impact over here on lands that are maybe not geographically right on the other side of the line, it could be 20 miles away. And so that's kind of the approach that it seemed like a lot of our TFPA proposals here were, were taking. 
And so that's, that's where I've been going with it. And that makes a lot of sense to me just because it fits with the language that's in the act and it fits with how these things actually work on the landscape. So it makes a lot of sense to think of it in terms of, okay, if we do this activity over here, it's gonna have this effect over here. It gets down to that idea of risk when it comes to fire. But then also when we're talking restoration, you know, it's in order to have meaningful restoration, you can't just necessarily look at it as it's within five paces over the line. It might be somewhere disjunct, but still close enough that there's a good tether as a, between the action you're taking and the effect you're looking for. Thanks, Micah. And I know, I know, um, you know, Keith and Micah, you all are in a maybe a situation where adjacency in a lot of cases you're already kind of there. You've got you know the, the reservation directly overlying um, the national forest. Brandon, I wanted to go to you next because you mentioned this idea of the, the ceded territory mm -hmm. of the Yakima Nation. And I wanted to know, like, uh, go back to that original question, like, how did you identify risk? How did that affect the adjacency question? And then, yeah, and then how did you rope in this idea of the, the ceded territory? Is anything in the ceded territory fair game in your estimation? Yeah, I, I think that's the agreement that we've we've kind of come to with the region is that uh, any anything not only in the ceded territory but in the UNA as well um, is is largely fair game and and the reason for that is kind of tied to risk because we have we have salmon right I mean and and so <laughs> it's a little complicated but the tribes. Uh, ability to harvest salmon is tied somewhat to the health of stocks that they go way up the, the Columbia River. There, there's endangered fish and they, you know, the endangered fish uh, sometimes force the shutdown of fisheries prematurely uh, because there's not enough. You gotta let them go by and all that, all that business. Um, and so there is risk for the tribe, uh, I, I think, spread out over a, a huge area because of all these different stocks that we're trying to um, fix habitat for. And so, I, again, I think Phil kind of worked that out with the regional forester sort of up front that, um, you know, our, our seated area and, and also there's some places like the Metha that's not in the seated area, but is definitely usual and custom um, would, would be considered um, adjacent, uh, you know, for the purposes of TFPA. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we've been operating. Sorry, you, you mentioned uh, maybe an acronym that I didn't catch. Did you say UNA? Yeah, uh, usual and custom area. Usual and custom uh, gathering and hunting and fishing areas. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, Shirley and Sean, I'll, I'll go to you next. What did, you know, how did how did the risk relate to your adjacency question? Well, for us, it was it was really simple. I think to choose where where we uh, we're going to do the project. Um, like I said, it, it's originated from RTRL. Acoma has, um, I think it's four, maybe five sections that are kind of off on their own, but they're adjacent to us. So, I mean, it was really a no brainer for us. Um, and I mentioned, you know, the it's it's at the base of Mount Taylor, which is the highest point on our forest, but a tribal cultural property. And so trying to create, you know, a fuel break, not only for Pueblo lands, but for the, the mountain itself, you know, it, it was really just kind of a no brainer for us. Yeah, like you mentioned, um, we do have the five sections up there and that area is um, isolated from the main reservation and uh, that area has been kind of neglected for a while. So we wanted to um, go back up there and start treating that area before, you know, we, we did lose it to something like a, a fire. So it was important for us to start finding ways to do some management projects up there and um, start looking to the future and utilizing that land up there um, for uh, ranching or um, forest development type of stuff. 
so that was our um i guess choice for picking that area of Juan horace and since the uh, forest service was just right there next to us how about um dan uh, did you have any comments on the the risk that the chilele identified you know beaver restoration yeah like you already mentioned it's kind of like already spreading beyond the original watershed, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I guess what I would say is this is, I think that it's important for all of us to look at the maximum flexibility that you can find within the authorizing language uh, and, and really like read it like a lawyer, except in the other direction. Don't read it in the way that constrains you the most, read it in the way that Avails you the maximum flexibility that those words can give you. So, you know, certainly, you know, insects and disease, uh, any and insects can fly. They can go from hillside to hillside. So that is, as far as we're concerned, that is adjacent. Fires can leap. Those are adjacent. Water flows far. Uh, and so that is adjacent. So as they said, you know, if you drop mercury up at the headwaters, it is adjacent. So I, I'd say, uh, for us with beavers, um, you know, there's the connection of uh, the usual and accustomed areas. Um, so these are the traditional lands and uh, fish habitat, which is what um, beavers are really doing. I mean, they are improving the flow, the regulating the flow, managing the temperatures in those waters. That is key for um, salmon, juvenile salmon. Uh, for their uh, their survivorship in those waters is key. And so I think it's really, really easy for us to make that connection. And then I make a plug, if you wanna stretch a little bit further, cultural adjacency, I think is one of the other things and cultural risk, I think is one of the other things that is worth people uh, considering because, um, you know, if you have traditional lands and in those lands, uh, those are the places where um, you know, tribal members, elders are, are teaching their stories, are passing on their lessons, are showing how to do the traditional activities that were being done. And those are, those are the landscapes that they've been doing that since time immemorial. Uh, any kind of work that you can be doing that ensures the, the uh, preservation and, and retention of those qualities in those landscapes I think directly addresses cultural risk. And so I think if you can talk about cultural risk, that really encompasses all those areas that were historically used. And, and, and I think that opens up the door to doing lots and lots of work together that's uh, probably targeted at the kinds of activities that would mean the most. So uh, stretch further uh, than bugs and water uh, and really look at absolutely everything that would have anything to do with how you preserve a culture. Uh, just following this, um, following this geography question a little further, Amelia had a question that, um, that I'm not sure about. Maybe some of you have comments on this for tribes and forest service units that are adjacent to the U.S. Canada border. How might climate risks and ecosystem restoration be coordinated in transboundary areas. Does anyone have experience with that? Brandon shaking his head no. Shirley and Sean, I'm going to give you a pass on this one probably. <laughs> yeah. We I, I'm going to I'm going to keep this question. This may be something I'll, I'll I'll send it to some of our presenters from the um, first session to see if we have any examples of TFPA or other um, tribal forest service cooperation that is, uh, you know, adjacent to that uh, boundary. Good question. Okay, I'm going to Kristen, uh, kind of a, a change of topic here. Kristen says, I was interested to hear about the workforce development piece on the ACAMA project. Um, and other projects talked about how TFPA added capacity from tribes to do work. 
curious to hear a bit more about how training or capacity have factored into the initial discussions on TFPA and what a, what a good approach might be for tribes with less capacity. Um, would anyone like to jump in first on this? I guess, uh, yeah, we'll go with Shirley and Sean. Start with the Akama example. Um, ahead, for, um, since uh, when I got here, it was pretty much a staff of two that uh, was the Akama Forestry Program. And with the funding we received through the RTRL grant, we were able to employ a uh, five-man Sawyer crew. And even with those individuals, uh, them, including myself, didn't really have all that much experience, um, I guess, knowing the functions of a Sawyer crew. So that project kind of helped us learn um, how to do these types of thinning projects. And while the funding was um, depleted through the RTRL, we were still trying to go after more um, grant money. But since we weren't getting awarded uh, that whole, the crew and their uh, knowledge that they had gained just kind of went away and we were just kind of left with the um, two person staff again. And with the TFPA and this additional funding that was granted to us by the Forest Service and the state, we're able to build back up again. Uh, it might, might not be the same uh, people that we had on, but you know we'll still be able to get new people and um, build their skills up to where we can probably build a stronger foundation to where we can keep them on, you know, year round instead of um, just project to project. But um, it's been kind of hard it's, and the pandemic definitely didn't help with that either. And uh, it's, it's been difficult trying to find people to come on, um, people just don't really want to work anymore. But <laughs> we've been um, informing the community, and the guys are getting interested again to work with us, and that's that helped us build our workforce development, um, and just kind of bringing on. Uh, the Hopi tribe to do our, our heritage surveys uh, is adding to that too. Um, like I had mentioned, the Hopi and the Akama are pretty much similar. And the Hopi tribe also considers Mount Taylor as their um, traditional cultural property. So that gives them a chance to at least get their feet on the ground and contribute to uh, helping protect that area for, for the Hopi tribe as well as assisting Akuma. So all around, I think this is a good thing to bring um, Akuma and Forest Service and the Hopi tribe together to continue to build that workforce development. Yeah, I'd like to add, it's probably been a little bit of a boom and bust for this project, you know, with the RTRL funding that going away, the the crew kind of dissolving, and now uh, you know with additional funds infused, the crew's building back up again. But um, you know, I think it provides us an opportunity to um, you know share the restoration prescriptions that we use, and you know, hopefully, they the work starts happening on both sides of the fence. Um, you know, the communities and the council maybe see the value in it. And eventually, you know, we won't have to rely on outside sources of funding. You know, this crew will just be something that is kind of always there and funded because there is such value in it. Thanks, you too. Can, can other folks speak a little bit about how you incorporated um, Workforce development. You talk to me after. Into okay. uh, your projects. How long are you going to be? Let's see. Brandon, 
and then I'll look at you first here off of you. Yeah, we we have a standing workforce. We have we have a, a whole project. So this is just this is just a part of of ongoing work we're doing. So not a lot of that for this particular project. How about you, Dan? Any comments on how the Tulalip are, or was that part of their interest in doing this work? I know they're, you mentioned they're hiring a staff of two for three years to do these uh, beaver relocations. Yeah, um, based on my conversations with Molly uh, Tulalip, um, the, the, I mean, that's those are seasonal employees, so they are developing skills, um, but uh, it, it wasn't really targeted towards developing a permanent workforce. Um, although some of the work that we're looking at with the Muckleshoot tribe uh, would would likely have a workforce development component um, in that it is you know, there. Part of the work that they're doing is uh, some of the road work associated with timber sales, and um, they do have and have been trying to grow a, uh, a tribal uh, member-based um, road crew. And so that is part of, that, that's going to be growing out their, um, their workforce there. Um, this probably highlights one of, the, one of the things that you can think about when you're looking at the type of agreement that you use, because TFBA, right, it's just a big umbrella. Uh, 638 is one of them. Lots of other kinds of uh, agreements are out there, and you have agreements like the participating agreement, which includes the Wyden Authority, and the Wyden Authority specifically authorizes workforce development as one of its objectives. And so um, when you're trying to mix and match the right authorities for the color of money uh, and where the work might happen, um, workforce development is one of those things that you can um, you can tailor with a participating agreement using wide and authority. Um, and, and it's, it's really valuable. Um, and I think that now with the interim guidance that we have from the chief about match reduction, um, using cost share and participating agreements, which historically had, um, match, uh, a heavy match component that was really tough on tribes. Um, that's going to be a lot easier to use those. So I think there's, I think the landscape is looking a lot better for, uh, for workforce development. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we, um, Tori Haka gave us a really nice overview of the different financial instruments that can be used to drive a TFPA project. And so she did go over that aspect of participating agreements. Um, and, and we also spent a lot of time talking about that match waiver. Uh, so exciting, exciting developments here. Um, Okay, uh, let's see, do, 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 do. Catherine, another um, general question. If, if any of you have experience with this, that'd be great. Um, has there been any consideration to remediating the abandoned mines that continuously drain water from surrounding forest areas? Um, and she gives a specific example of the Jamestown Mines Harvard pit, is that, um, is that an opportunity for TFPA work between tribes and national forests? Any of you care to comment? Well, I'll just say that, you know, I haven't really thought about that, but I don't see why it wouldn't fit somehow. Um, it's, it's restoration. So, I mean, that, I think that's how we'd probably approach it, um, at least on the face of things. Just, yeah, you know, this, this is restoration. I would think if it's under TFPA or 638 or some some jigsaw way. I'm seeing Dan nodding his head too. Uh, yeah. Uh, general consensus. Yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Susan Johnson has a question in here. Have any of you considered a rangeland project under TFPA? Uh, Keith and Micah, that not, might not apply to you. Shirley and Sean, I'm not sure if there are rangelands that might be of mutual interest between the Acoma Pueblo. Um, Brandon or Dan, I'm not sure if, if rangelands are much of a concern in your area. 
Well, I'd say in the Southwest here, um, you know, I showed the slide about how things have thickened up with fire exclusion. Um, and as a result of that, our understories have become, um, you know, there's just not a whole lot of species diversity underneath there. And in some places, the the herbaceous layer is almost non-existent. So any kind of restoration work that we do always tends to benefit range. But, um, you know, we didn't necessarily go into this as a range project. But, you know, there are mutual benefits, I would say, for sure. Yeah, and I in most of our thinning projects, we do include that as one of the um, objectives is to increase the forage production for the wildlife and the livestock. I know there is some grazing that's going on in that area uh, where we have our um, TFP project going on. And that was uh, kind of one of our goals um, with doing work on our side of the fence up there on Akama is uh, maybe one day uh, having some of the cattle groups rotate some of their livestock up there to the Mesa, but it was just kind of a thought, not really um, uh, one of the main reasons why we're doing this thinning, but that is one of our, um, I guess, site benefits is that we are kind of looking into uh, bringing that range uh, range uh, livestock uh, types of activities back up to Horace. Okay, um, let's see, I'm gonna go for one more question. Last question from uh, Jonathan. Well, Jonathan, you got two questions in here. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll give you this, uh, okay. So two questions from Jonathan. Number one, Jonathan at the Forest Service Research and First Nations Development Institute are planning a webinar series on indigenous stewardship on national forests and an associated report. Would you speakers be interested in contributing again to another webinar series and maybe writing up your examples for the report? First question, Keith is nodding. Sean and Shirley are nodding. Dan, okay, John, you've got some ready participants here. I'll, I can put you in touch. And then um, maybe a bigger question from John. How do you think these partnership objectives that you each have mentioned could be or are being factored into forest plan revision? Are any of you on your national forests approaching forest plan revision or even thinking about that? Um, let's see, Micah, I'll go to you first. Yeah, we're probably six years out before we get to our next scheduled revision. So, I mean, it's something that we can consider, but you know, the, the times between doing revisions are so long and the, uh, the expense that goes into doing revisions is so high that it's um, probably most of the time uh, better to approach it with an amendment or a series of amendments if there's something specific that's not already within the range of discretion within the forest plan. That's something that, you know, as we get line officers thinking about TFPA proposals and, and uh, shared stewardship or co-management, um, there is a wide range of discretion that's currently written into the forest, like our forest plan, and I'm sure a lot of other forest plans, where we can accommodate a lot of these things in the landscape. Um, long-term trajectory when we get beyond the, you know, the requirements for restocking and, and things like that. So, you know, there's, I think that's probably the, the, the biggest part to look at first is what does the forest plan currently allow for range of discretion? And are we taking advantage of that? Are there places where we can look at individual projects as uh, using an EA to accomplish an amendment? And then when we look at revisions, given the really long timelines and the expense to go about doing a proper revision, that if we are slated to come up for one, yes, that's something we can look at. But um, those timetables are, you know, that's that's driven by by funding decisions that are made far above us at the unit level. So um, it's kind of as we get an opportunity to do it, yeah, we'll look at it. 
but it's um, it's not something that it's probably the least responsive way we would have to go about incorporating some of these things in what we're trying to do on the landscape. So um, it's something we keep in mind, but it'll be a while before we get there. Keith, it's just gonna keep asking every week. Um, <laughs> but Mike, I thank you. I, I like that idea of looking at amendments. Maybe if there's if there's some something that isn't being currently accommodated in the in the discretion or flexibility of the plan. Um, Gene or Sean, is there anything else you would add about you know how your forests are sitting with forest plan revision? Dan, you said you're over a decade away. Well, we are fortunate enough to have just uh, had our plan finished, signed, and released about a month ago. So um, fortunately, I was not deeply involved in the process. It's kind of funny because Dan and I were on a previous forest kind of working together <laughs> on plan revision. But so what we do have, we have some language, a core management theme about respecting cultural and traditional landscapes and uses. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar enough to know any more about partnership language, but I can tell you as a forest, we, uh, we are highly encouraged to enter into any and all partnerships we can to get work done on the ground. So uh, I think most forests are probably like that with, uh, you know, kind of a general lack of base funding. So that's where we're at. Sean, if you would be interested to follow up with me, I'd be interested to get, a, get an excerpt um, from that new plan. Um, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, and Dan, I'm glad you, you chimed in here that that idea of having a, an MOU or MOA between the national forest and a tribe could be a great first step. Um, that was something that our speakers on Tuesday really hammered home is that like having that sort of foundation or, or umbrella agreement that kind of sets out mutual priorities and and that also is your way of institutionalizing or memorializing those shared priorities to deal with that churn of staff turnover. That was something we heard really strongly on Tuesday. And it seemed like that work had already been done for, for all of you, you know, before you got into the nitty gritty of, of hashing out a TFP, you already kind of had a standing agreement. Um, and in some cases, some handshake agreements that go back decades and decades. So thank you for, for bringing us back to that. Um, okay, I am thinking we should we should probably call it here um, out of respect for people's time. I just wanna share um, one final thing. Uh, first of all, thank you again to our speakers. Uh, everyone, please join me in giving a virtual round of applause. Um, I really appreciate having your your experience um, and your your candor uh, answering some of these questions that is great um, and so we appreciate you kind of helping the whole community here uh, learn together um, for all of you listening uh, live or listening at home to the recording um, I'm posting uh, the recordings of these webinars the presentations and um, several resources uh, and links that have been suggested at this website. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the in the chat uh, for you now. One second. Um, okay, there it is. And I I have all of your email addresses, all of you registered participants. Um, so expect an email from me again in the next day or two um, with an update. To resources that have been shared. Um, one thing I wanted to call out that um, Tori didn't mention on Tuesday, she went through all those different agreement types. And I know for me, it, you know, the details start to blur together once we start talking about four or five different um, types of agreements. She's got a really nice comparison matrix, um, a couple of page PDF that really specifies what each of those different agreements can be used for and how they um, how they can contribute to carrying forward a TFPA. So look for that and other things at this website. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. Uh, this has been a wonderful session. 
um, those of you who are participating in one of our upcoming workshops in the eastern region between national forests and tribes stay tuned for more detail we're going to be um, hitting you all with a lot of coordination information in the next couple of days okay thanks everyone let's say to be continued go out and do great work thanks Stephen. Thank you.